Welcome to the lecture on visualization and interpretability. So why do we actually have a lecture on visualization? Well, it turns out that there's uh, several ways that one can actually visualize comnets. And all of these ways are actually a great way for debugging your CNN. So you can visualize the features that you get after training a CNN, you can visualize the activations, you can visualize the gradients, there are certain visualizations also um, to see whether um, your neural network is making accurate predictions, is making predictions that actually make sense, for example like TSNE visualization. And it turns out that this is a really powerful way of analyzing your convolutional neural network. So often it is hard to see what is happening inside a ComNet. Uh, some people say this is more like a black box and you don't really know how the ComNet is making decisions. And actually using visualization tools is one way, uh, one step forward towards understanding what is happening inside these ComNets. So let's see what type of visualizations we actually have. So in order to visualize and understand CNNs, we can start actually by visualizing in the image base. So for example, here we have a really simple convolutional neural network. We have um, this, uh, this image that acts as an input. And then we have, for example, the first layer, five by five convolutions with strike one, which gives you this um, output of size 28, 28 by six. Uh, then you have an average pulling operation, another 5x5 five five operation, etc, etc, until you reach um, these two series of fully connected layers that give you your classification. So in order to visualize things in the image space, you can pick a unit in layer 1, and then what we will do is we will find the nine image patches in your data set, so, so you will train your neural network with a given training data set. And then you will find the nine image patches amongst all of the images in your data set that actually maximize this unit's activation. So in this case, let's say I pick uh, one of uh, the convolutional filters, one of these uh, five by five filters, and I actually want to observe um, all the image patches that maximized the activation of this filter. So here I have uh, my, uh, my maximal response. And now uh, what I can do is I can actually map this response to the image, right? I can say this particular image patch was the one responsible for maximally activating my unit there. And uh, if we actually do this, we can visualize in the image space, which means these are actually real patches extracted from the images. And we can see, for example, for uh, feature map one of layer one, the nine uh, image patches that provide the highest activation are these patches that we're actually showing here. So you can see that they all depict this kind of um, diagonal um, trend here, uh, which means that actually this, um, this particular filter was activated by this um, diagonal shape. So if we actually observe a second feature map for again the first layer, we see that the shape has of course changed, so this filter is actually focused on a different type of uh, geometrical shape. So as we can see in layer one, um, here, for example, we plot these um, nine patches that mostly activated each of these nine filters in layer one. So ranging from filter one all the way to two, three, four, and filter nine. And you see that some filters are activated by just like green patches, no edges present there. We have uh, diagonal edges in both directions. We have different colors. So, so each of these filters is responsible for detecting um, a different geometrical pattern. So when we go to layer two, um, we start to see more interesting things. So remember that in layer one, the convolutional filters um, from, you, as you have seen in, in I2DL, um, these are mostly responsible for actually um, detecting geometrical shapes, detecting edges, vertical, horizontal, while in layer two, we start already seeing some more complex patterns. So for example, 
uh, in, for the case for this filter, we see that the patches that Maxwell activated are, are patches that show mostly eyes or, or these round shapes. Uh, we see also some, some interesting horizontal um, textures here. So uh, we can already start seeing some more interesting shapes appearing when we actually observe what maximally activates the filters in layer 2. And uh, so here we have, we have an example of these of this eye shapes that I was talking about, or these round shapes that maximally activate this filter, or these uh, kind of vertical uh, stripes, these repetitive structures that activate the filter of layer 2. In layer 5, of course, things get even more interesting because we start to see parts of an object, right? So we see filters that are responsible for detecting these kind of um, shapes that we can see in keyboards or we can see in, in, in coffee machines, for example. Um, while this filter in, label, in uh, layer 5 is actually responsible for detecting logos, for example. So it's so really interesting to actually uh, visualize what are um, the patches in image space that maximally activate the filters in different layers. And of course, then we have like, other filters that are focusing on flowers, filters that are focusing on uh, dogs. So things become more and more specialized as we move um, deeper into the network. So this was uh, visualizing an image space. Um, we can also, of course, uh, visualize the importance of um, a certain part of an image. So for this, uh, what the authors of, of this EC14 paper proposed was uh, what is called the occlusion experiment. So in this experiment, what we do is we actually... Um, so we have again um, our trained uh, convolutional neural network, which we will depict by this, uh, by this orange shape here. And this network is trained for the, class, uh, for the task of classification. So in this case, it's pretty sure with confidence 0.96 that this is actually the image of a dog. So um, the occlusion experiment, what it consists of is um, you actually take your image and you block different parts of the image. And then what you want to see is you want to see how this classification score actually changes. So um, let's look at this with an example. So let's assume that I actually put a, a gray patch on top of the lower left corner of this image. So this patch is not, it's not really blocking the image of the dog, it's blocking mostly the grass. So as we can expect, the, the classification score is not going to change too much. So, so the neural network is still able to say with high confidence that this is actually a dog. Now what happens if we block the face of the dog, right? So, so the, the nose of the dog cannot be seen, the eye of the dog cannot be seen, uh, one ear is, is partially blocked. So now almost all the face of the dog is covered. And what we're going to observe actually is that the confidence of this neural network, the confidence in saying that this is actually a dog, has dropped significantly. So from 0 0.95 to 0 uh, 0.35. So now the network is really not confident that this is a dog. So of course, um, this tells us something that, that is obvious for us, right? Um, and it tells us that, for example, the face of the dog is more important for classification than the grass beneath the dog, because a dog could be sitting on grass, could be sitting on, on a wooden floor, could be sitting on tiles, could be sitting anywhere. So the floor or the background is not important to actually classify the dog. So with this occlusion experiment, what we can do is we can actually create a map. Now we can create a map or an image where each pixel actually represents the classification probability if an occlusion square is placed exactly on that region centered on that pixel. So um, just to make things clear, so, so this is um, the map that we would obtain for this image. And specifically what it says is that in order to obtain the value of the map on this pixel here, where the gray square is centered, um, we actually, what we need to do is we need to place a gray square centered around this pixel, we need to compute the classification probability, and then put the classification value on this pixel in the map. So what we can see as a result is 
kind of um, the importance of parts of the image. So for example, this part of the image, which coincides with the face of the dog, is much more important for classification for the neural network because all of these values here are very low. Which means that if we actually place a square centered around one of those pixels, the classification score for uh, this dog is going to go down significantly. So this actually gives you a lot of information of the content of, um, of an image and how actually a neural network sees the image. So, of course, if we actually want to, to classify, for example, the car wheel as it is for this image, this part of the image where the car wheel is visible is going to be the most important. If we want to classify Afghan hound in this image, the region where the dog is is actually the most important. And we can expect that if we actually uh, wanted to classify people, then these regions would become more important. So it is important to see that actually this map is unique between one image but also one classification label. So we need to pick both and for each classification label we will obtain a different map. And again the pixels uh, with the lowest value are actually the most important pixels for the classification of this particular class for this particular image. So we move on now towards uh, visualizing the actual features. So visualizing these uh, convolutional kernels, what are these convolutional kernels really looking at in the image? And in order to do this, um, what we actually, so, so one of the ways of doing this is uh, the method called deconfnet. And how this method actually works is um, the main idea is to map the neural network activations back to the image base and then see what we get out there. So, so we want to somehow visualize these activations by projecting them back to the image base. So how does it work? So um, at, the, at the top row we have um, a classic confnet, right? So we have our image that goes through uh, the CNN, which is depicted in orange. And from this image, we actually obtain a feature representation. We obtain, for example, a vector that represents this image. And with this vector, we do, for example, image classification. Now, the idea of a deconfnet is to do the opposite, to go from the image, uh, from the feature representation, sorry, all the way back to the image. So, um, this is just for the purposes of visualization, right? So we're not going to go into the, into the mentality of our encoders just yet. So um, the idea here is slightly different. The idea is that uh, we're going to use this deconfnet to actually do feature visualization. And for this, of course, the first thing that we have to do is we have to decide uh, what kind of layers, so which of the layers of my CNN do I actually want to visualize, right? Which of these filters am I going to visualize? So we're going to do um, an overview of the process is we have this component, we put the image in, uh, we process it, we pass it through a CNN until a certain layer, the layer that we actually want to visualize, and then we jump. We jump to the deconfnet that it's going to bring our features all the way to the image space. So again, we're not going to get into the whole uh, mentality of um, the autoencoders in which we want to obtain, for example, a semantic segmentation as an output. No, here we want to use the deconfnet to visualize the features of a certain layer. So um, how this works is we first choose an input image, we forward pass it through the network, we say, okay, I decide that I want to observe filter 15, for example, of the third convolutional layer, because I know this is highly activated by this image. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to zero out all the other filters. So only this filter 15 of the third layer will actually have the features that I've obtained by passing the image through the CNN. And then I will take this block of features which contains the features of filter 15 and all the other filters filled with zeros. And I will pass this 
through the DCONF net that will take this representation and blow it back to the image space. So let's look at a bit, uh, a bit more in detail how the DCONF net actually does this, right? So um, here you can see the CONF net and DCONF net actually um, interacting with each other. So I have the CONF net that processes this, um, that, or let's say the processes, the, the operations of the CONF net are depicted here on the right, and the operations of the DCONF net are depicted on the left. So what we do as a process is we take an image in, we process it, process it through the conf net all the way going up, then we switch to the deconf net, then we go down through the operations of the deconf net all the way into um, the image space again. And so you can see here the classic operations of the conf net, right? Like convolutional filters, some nonlinear activations, some relus, for example, some pullins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what we will have is mirrored operations that we'll describe now, uh, which are present in the DCONF net. So um, let's start with the first operation, uh, which we call unpooling. So in, the, um, in a CONF net, one of the key operations, one of the well-known operations is the max pooling operation, right? So you have uh, your feature map, which is, for example, uh, four by four, and with the max pooling operation, you can reduce it to a size of two by two by taking out of four numbers, taking only the maximum one, right? So um, this is depicted, for example, in here, where we have this four by four feature map. And for each of these colored regions in here, for each of these two by two regions, what we do is we pick the maximum value, and this is the value that will be passed onto this max pooled map. So from this 4x4 representation, we will obtain a 2x2 representation. Now what this does is, is um, it reduces the spatial size, which is something really common as we go deeper and deeper into convolutional neural networks, as we go from one layer to the next. But now for the deconf net, we need to have the opposite operation. And this is what is called the unpooling operation. Now the unpooling operation, what it does is it needs to bring this two by two representation into a four by four representation. So this is depicted um, all the way here at the bottom. You see this unpooling actually goes from this two by two representation to this four by four. And so what it has to do is essentially it has to make a decision what kind of values am I going to put in this four by four representation? Because it's not so obvious where to put certain values of the two by two representation and what to do with the other uh, positions. Should I put it zero? What should I do? So um, the unpooling operation in the DCONF net actually um, is about putting these maximum locations that we obtain from this operation exactly where the maximum location came from from the pooling operation. Right, so what I'm going to do is, during the polling operation of the DCONF net, I'm going to record exactly in this max location map where the maximums came from. So which position in the pooled, um, in the, sorry, in the original map, which was the position that contained this maximum value that was later passed to this pool map. So you can see these four locations here. Now, in the unpooling operation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, um, these locations and I'm going to say this maximum here should be put in the location where the maximum came from. Same for the maximum of the green region, same for the maximum of the red region. So you see that I've now located these four maximum values in these four locations that I obtained from the pooling operation. Now, the second, um, the second uh, operation is, is the ReLU, right? So, so in the, in the CONF net, we have these nonlinear activations. Usually, these are ReLUs for convolutional neural networks. And um, now the idea is what kind of nonlinear operation shall I have in a DCONF net? Well, it turns out that you can still use a ReLU because you're still interested in having positive features for visualization. You're, you're interested in killing off all the negative values. So a ReLU is going to do just fine. 
So I mentioned this operation, right? I do this. Um, I do this processing of of my uh, convolutional features. I still eliminate the negative ones, so I'm going to be left with really strong positive activations, which I'm then going to visualize in the image space. Um, so now one note um, that I forgot about this about this unpooling is that um, it's actually why do we actually do this, right? So the whole idea here is that um, if I had an activation um, in the ConvNet, right, this usually represents, you know, for example, an edge or something like this. So, it's, so it was an important part of the image. I want to keep it when I do the unpooling, right? This is all about visualization. So I want to keep the structures that I killed in, this, in these pooling operations, right? Because when you do these pooling operations, you kind of kill a little bit the structure of the image, right? At least the details. So I want to go back to the image space and I want to recover these details. I actually want to recover them in the right positions, right? I want to recover these, these edges in the right position where the edge was, especially if I do a lot of max and pooling, I want to put the information exactly where it was in the original image. So that's the intuition behind this, uh, behind this type of unpooling. Okay, and now the third and most important operation, right? So what we actually want is uh, we want to mirror the convolution operation, right? And again, this is um, so you don't have to go into the mindset of autoencoders, right? This is not a transpose convolution. There's nothing like that. It's actually a deconvolution operation. It's actually uh, we want to do the opposite operation that we did um, in the ConvNet, right? And in practice, what we're going to do is we're going to convolve with a transpose of the filter that we learned in this ConvNet here. And uh, in the paper, and here we use transpose um, a little bit, so, so we kind of overuse this word, uh, because it's literally a vertically and horizontally flipped version of this learned convolutional filter. So important thing here, the convolutional filter that we're going to use in uh, the deconfnet is not learned. It's merely this transpose version of the learned filter, the filter that we learned when we trained this combat. So let's look at, at why is, is it this transpose, right? So um, this is because, again, we don't want to reconstruct any type of, of output here with our deconfnet, right? Like we would in an autoencoder. But we actually want to find out which of the inputs really influence my outputs and by how much, right? So imagine a convolutional filter, it's going through an image. Now each of the, of the operations of weights being multiplied by the pixels of the image means that you will give certain importance to each of the pixels, right? And you actually want to find out what was this importance that you gave to that pixel when you passed it through your ConvNet. So let's look at this with an example, right? So, so we have this 7 by 7 input, right? Uh, we do this convolutional operation, which gives us now um, this 5 by 5 output. And uh, we can do another conv operation, for example, this 3x3 this three three filter, which will give us, again, another reduction. So here we're not using padding or anything of the sort. So um, from our 7x7 seven seven input with a couple of convolution operations, we reach this 3x3 uh, three three output. And we see, for example, depicted in this case, this 3x3 uh, this three three filter that gives us one uh, output, one pixel of this 3x3 three three output, is actually computed from this um, three by three convolutional operation. So for one of the output uh, pixels, right, in this in this three by three map, is actually connected to nine input pixels. So it took uh, nine input pixels, it took those values multiplied by nine ways, and it created this one output pixel. Now. When we actually apply this, um, this deconvolution, right, it means that we're not going all the way down to this 3x3 three three output, but we're actually stopping at the 5x5, five five, and then we're applying this deconvolution operation. Now, we're going to do the same thing that we did before with the 5x5 five five input that created the 3x3 three three output, 
But now our 3x3 three three convolutional filter depicted in, in green here um, is going to create this black pixel output. So it took those nine pixels to actually generate the black pixel output. Now, each of these pixels had a different influence on the black pixel output, right? Depending on the value of the weight of this convolutional filter, um, for example, the, the red pixel had a different influence than the orange pixel into the final value of this black pixel of the 5x5 five five, uh, map. So, we know that, the, that there's this different contribution to the value of the black output pixel. And actually what we want in the deconvolution is to keep that contribution when we reconstruct the input, right? In this case, of course, the contribution is the weights. So we want that the relationship between this pixel here and this pixel here is still kept when we do the deconvolution. Right? So see that this uh, red location here is the same red location here. Um, for the case of the green pixel, again, it's the same. We want that whatever operation we do in this deconvolution, uh, in this deconf net, we actually end up at the same location uh, of the green pixel in the 7x7 output. So, of course, this, is, um, this, this might seem obvious, right? But we have to have a convolutional operation that keeps this relationship here. And therefore, we have to shift our, our convolutional kernel to keep this, um, this condition here. So if we have this, this uh, convolutional 3x3 three three kernel, right? we have our weights depicted with different colors here. Um, the question is, um, how can I express this deconvolutional operation still as a convolutional operation and still obtain the relationship between the black pixel and the red pixel as it was when I did the convolutional operation. Right, so, so the question is, um, what kind of shape, what kind of weights does this deconvolutional kernel need to have so that when I slide it through the image, I will have exactly the red weight connecting these two pixels from the 5x5 input to the 7x7 output. So let's see it better with, um, let's go pixel by pixel, see if we, if we understand this concept. So let's, um, let's talk about the red pixel, right? So the question is, what kind of operation do I have to do on the 5x5 five five input to actually get the red pixel? So let's forget for a minute um, about the pixels here in the border, right? Let's just look at this pixel here. If I look at this pixel here, in, in order to, to generate this pixel with a convolutional operation, means that I have to place uh, my 3x3 three three convolutional filter in this position, right? This will take these nine values and it will generate one pixel value that will be put at the center position, which is this one here. Now, the question is, in which um, position is the black pixel within this red square? It is in this position now. So, if I put the red weight in here of my convolutional filter, right? In my decom filter, I have to put it in this position so that when I slide it through the image, when I am in this position, it will interact with the black pixel in order to generate this output pixel here, right? So let's look now at uh, the blue pixel, for example. So in order to generate the blue pixel, this is where I actually have to place my 3x3 three three convolutional kernel or deconf kernel. Um, and now again, I ask the same question. So where is the black pixel here? So the black pixel is in this uh, bottom middle position, which means that if I place the blue weight in this position, it will be multiplied by the black pixel when it has to generate the blue pixel. So I keep um, asking this question, right? I keep um, generating the purple pixel, the dark blue pixel, etc., etc. And what I will obtain in the end 
is this um, so-called transpose filter. So you see that what I've actually done is I've taken my convolutional filter and I've um, flipped it horizontally and vertically. So if I now take my deconf 3x3 kernel and I convolve it through my 5x5 into input, I will obtain my 7x7 output and the relationship between the black pixel and all of these pixels will be still this one, which is what I was interested in. So the relationship will be kept between convolution and deconvolution. And again, here I'm not talking about the, um, the outer pixels, of course. So this is the reason why um, we need this, this transpose filter. So again, the important thing here is that we're not actually learning this, um, these convolutions in the deconf net, but we're simply mirroring the operation that happened uh, in the conf net. So um, what we're going to do now is we're going to visualize, okay, what happens when I do this operation, this, this convolutional uh, operation first, then switching to a deconf net and going back to the image base. So what I obtain are um, a representation like this. So here in the bottom, I have my uh, image patches that I had from the previous visualization. And here I have the visualization of these features. So in this case, this um, filter corresponds to these nine image patches and this filter corresponds to these nine image patches. And you see quite a nice correlation, right? So you see these, these um, edges, for example, in this direction, and the image patches, in fact, show edges in this direction. Um, same for edges in this direction, patches show edges in this direction. And again, as I go, um, as, I, as I visualize all the features in layer one, I can see some interesting uh, geometrical shapes here. So I can see all these, all these round shapes, all these vertical um, stripes, which is what I would expect or, or what by, um, by that point everyone uh, found out that actually convolutional neural networks are doing. Um, and that was that in the first layers, uh, they were looking at geometrical features, these edges, these, these blobs. And as we go into uh, deeper layers, for example, layer three, we start seeing all these patterns uh, that we actually like. We start seeing car wheels, we start seeing faces, more complex geometrical shapes, um, a lot of insects, a lot of cats and dogs also. And um, another interesting thing that we can do is we can actually visualize these features. We can visualize the evolution of these features as we train our network longer and longer. And what we see, especially here in, in layer three, is that at the beginning, there's not much to see, right? So, so these um, features, these layers are still being trained. So these features are quite blurry and they become more and more, um, let's say, specialized, more and more um, salient, all of, these, all of these visualizations. And they really show how the network is learned. So here, for example, it was focusing on the face of the dog, then it became a bit more general, probably to incorporate other type of dogs. So from this, you can actually see whether your neural network is training properly or not. Um, now there are, um, so, so one thing that, that we didn't discuss was, um, or, or let's say the only operation that we didn't change in the decomp net was the ReLU, right? We said we're going to use the ReLU in the same exact way. Well, um, there are ways of inverting the ReLU. There are several ways um, that have been proposed in the literature. And for this, uh, we, we will point you to this, um, to this paper that explains several ways uh, of inverting this ReLU and what are the effects of these, of these several ways of inverting the values. The most important thing is that actually visualization helps. Visualization helps training your neural network. So for example, on uh, the AlexNet um, CNN, um, they actually found through visualization um, that the first layer had an unhealthy mix of low and high frequency information. So essentially, all the mic frequencies were ignored. 
And so they proposed this solution to change from 11 by 11 convolutions to 7 by 7 convolutions. Um, nowadays, neural networks contain mostly 3 by 3 convolutions, 5 by 5 convolutions. It's really um, rare to find such large um, convolutional filters. And actually, um, if you visualize your neural network when trained with 11 by 11 filters, you actually see that a lot of the filters are kind of inactive. So you can see here a lot of filters that contain no clear response to edges or blocks. Therefore, you can consider them to be kind of inactive. Well, if you switch to the 7x7 seven seven filters, you see that all of them are active, all of them um, show clearly um, the response to these edges in different directions, to the blobs, to different, um, different colors also. And the inactive um, filters are reduced quite a lot. So you can see through visualization what is the best configuration for your neural network. Now, a second observation they did on AlexNet is was, um, it was that on the second layer, they observed some aliasing artifacts. And these were essentially caused by the large strides. So again, AlexNet uses a stride of four in order to heavily reduce your feature map for computational reasons. Nowadays, using a stride of four is again really rare. So we can see actually through visualization what happens when we switch from a stride of 4 to a stride of 2. So you can see on the left what happens if you're using a stride of 4 and you can see clearly the aliasing artifacts. So you can see here these kind of blocky responses which are um, clearly artificial. You can see it uh, in several filters while if you use the 2 by 2, um, sorry, the stride of 2, um, you have much more natural responses for the filter. So you can see this on the right side. Now the best part is that um, the filters um, are looking better when you actually make these changes from 11 by 11 uh, filters to 7 by 7 filters and from strata 7 to strata 2. But also the classification score is improved by 2 percentage points. So please actively use visualization to debug your CNNs. This is a really strong, powerful tool that aside from uh, making you understand or, or let's say bringing you closer to understanding what happens inside convolutional neural networks, it's actually a really good tool to debug your CNNs. Now we have seen one way of visualizing the features and this is using the DeconfNet, as we have explained now, to visualize the features at a certain layer. But there is actually a second way to visualize your features. And this is through gradient ascent. So what you want to do there is you want to generate the synthetic image that maximally activates a filter. And you're going to do this with the opposite operation that we use for, um, for training our neural networks, which is gradient ascent. We're now going to use gradient ascent. So let's see how this works out, actually. So your goal is to find an image i that maximizes the score for a particular class. So you want to now generate an image. So this is sort of a generative process. You want your output is actually i. And you want to generate this i that maximizes the score for a particular class. And the score is actually taken before the softmax layer. So it's a direct output of the fully connected layer. And uh, this is represented by um, S, um, C, S underscore C of I. So this is actually this score uh, that you want to maximize. And you, only, and you also have an L2 um, norm to actually avoid having only uh, very few large pixels. So some regularization is needed here in order to create an image um, that, that actually represents um, this score that you want to observe. And now the question is, how do I generate this image, right? So the process goes, you get, first of all, a trained CNN, right? So you have to have a pre-trained CNN uh, for whatever classification problem you want. And um, you actually pass a zero image through this CNN. 
And this zero image is, um, you can actually observe it here, right? So if in your CNN, the mean of the training images was subtracted to all images, now the zero image is kind of the, um, the mean for, uh, for the CNN, right? So all the images that have passed through the CNN have mean zero. And so now what we do is we pass the zero image through the CNN and we obtain a score for class C, one class that we have randomly decided. Now the third step, what we want to do is want to maximize this score, right? So we want to change not the weights of the CNN, but we want to change the image. But we can still use backpropagation, we can still use all the optimization uh, that we have learned at I2DL, but instead of changing the weights with, uh, with our gradients, we're going to change the initial image. So we're going to go from the score for C, which we actually want to maximize. Since we want to maximize this, we're going to do gradient ascent, we're going to do back propagation, and we're going to make a small update on the image based on the gradient. And now this is an iterative process. So we have to repeat this process of changing um, the image, making a small change on the image, passing it through the CNN, computing the score, doing gradient ascent all the way back to the image and making another small change. Now, if we iterate, and now what we do is add the training mean image, we obtain these beautiful images here. So on the left, we can see an image if we have trained um, to maximize the score of bell pepper. And you can roughly see that we can see some of these, of these bell peppers popping out. Same for lemon in the middle image or husky in the image on the far right. Now, you might, you might say, well, these images look okay, right? But, but I can still improve them, right? So, so they still don't bring out these, these lemons, for example, in a really salient way. And there is actually a way to improve visualization with a better regularization. So the L2 regularization is, uh, is good. Um, so it brings out some of the characteristics of these bell peppers, these lemons, uh, but they can actually use a different type of regularization. So what we can do is uh, we can use this Gaussian blur on the image. We can clip the pixels with small value to zero, and at the same time, clip the gradients with small value to zero. So essentially what we're doing is we're saying anything that is not really a strong response, we just clip it to zero. And the same goes for the gradients. So if we actually do this, what we're going to do is we're going to exaggerate these features. We're going to exaggerate this um, these lemons and bell peppers, and we're going to obtain essentially nicer images. So you can see here for the flamingos, we have all these nice flamingos coming up now in the picture. Same for the pelican, the ground beetle, and the Indian cobra. So you see now that, that by clipping these small values, we bring, so all of these, of these objects are now more salient, and we can really see the characteristics of all these animals. Now, I welcome you to actually visit this site. So it's really, it's really fun to play around with this visualization. You can visualize at different layers. You can see um, what is the effect of, um, of this visualization on different layers. And you can um, kind of play around to understand how a neural network actually sees um, the different images and the different classes. So, okay, there, there is something, um, kind of a fun work that was developed in 2015, which is called Deep Dream. I'm sure you all heard about it. And it is related to the visualization that technique that we saw um, right now. So until now, what we did was want to synthesize an image to actually maximize a specific feature or a specific class. Um, so what we're going to do now in Deep Dream is um, we're going to do a slightly different operation. We're going to actually amplify the feature activations for some layer in the network. So this is going to work like this. We're going to fit an image to the network, any image to the network. We're going to choose a layer and actually ask the network to enhance whatever was detected. 
So if in that layer I actually detected some dogs because there was a dog in the image and um, actually the layer that is responsible for the dog detection was activated quite nicely. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask my network to amplify these activations. So if the network is seeing dogs, I want the network to see more dogs and I want the image to reflect more dogs. So how this goes is um, I do this forward pass of the image up to a layer, L. Now what I do is I set the gradient of the layer to have the same value as the activations. So intuitively how this works is if I have my dog filter that has large activation, so it's really activated by this image, if I equal the gradient to the activation, I will also have large gradients during back propagation. Right? So if I now use these gradients to make a change in the image, the image will be changed to show more dogs. So what I do is I set the gradient of the layer to this activation. I have the large activation, so I'm going to have a large gradient for this dog filter. I'm going to back propagate and I'm going to update the image, same as we did in the technique before. Now, if I iterate this process, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make small changes to the image according to a specific layer, right? So we already know that the low layers are responsible for detecting these basic features, these geometrical features. So if I do the forward pass only until the first layers, when I change the image according to these layers, what I'm going to do is I'm going to enhance these geometrical features. So for example, this is this one example that we can observe here where all these um, geometrical features, these, these edges, are enhanced in this image, causing this effect that we observe here. Now, if I go um, towards the deep layer, so my forward pass goes towards the deep layers, we know that there we already start detecting parts of the objects, we already start detecting full objects in some cases, so if I now do this whole operation with the deep layers of a neural network, I'm going to start to see whole objects appearing in my images. So we can see, for example, the image of the sky. I do the forward pass. And for some reason, all these objects start to appear when I do the deep dream optimization. So apparently these are the features that are maximally activated and therefore um, we start seeing all these objects appearing. Now, of course, um, this depends heavily on how you train your neural network. So this neural network was trained uh, with quite some, um, some bias on animals. So we see usually a lot of eyes, a lot of heads, bird heads appearing here and there. If you have an image that is trained only to detect cars or person, then you will have a different response. And of course, then we can start doing art with this, um, with deep ring and creating really pretty images, you can see that there's quite a lot of bias in, in having all these eyes appearing. Um, so this is quite a, quite a fun thing to do. And of course, you can do this for videos, right? So you can do this, uh, in this case, it's just a video of someone strolling through a supermarket and you can see how um, these images are changed to have all kinds of funny dog heads appearing, so this is actually quite a, quite a fun experiment. Okay, so moving on now to um, another visualization technique, TSNE. So this is a very popular visualization technique. It's it's um, in most of the um, in most of the frameworks for training neural networks. And essentially, what TSNE gives you is the possibility to visualize, for example, the last fully uh, connected layer. So of course, if we look at at AlexNet, for example, the AlexNet architecture, only the last fully connected layer has dimension four thousand ninety six. So visualizing a 4096 vector is not so easy, these, these 4096 dimensions, right? Um, so what we have to do is we need a technique that actually brings this to a lower dimension that we can actually plot. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to do a forward pass of all the images. 
and get their 4096 representations. And uh, one thing that we can do, of course, is do nearest neighbor visualization, right? So, so you take these representations, you compute uh, the L2 distances between all of these uh, 4096 representations, and then you observe what are the closest images to, for example, a test image in feature space. So you can see that this works pretty well for a trained neural network, right? So if I put the image of a flower, I get a bunch of images of similar flowers. Same happens for elephants, dogs, sheep, etc. So this is one way to actually visualize your feature space. But what I would actually like to visualize is all of these clusters that are appearing, right? So, so if I put a flower and I get all kinds of flowers, um, it, for, for the images that are closer to, to this image of the flower in feature space, I can imagine that all of these clusters exist in that 4096 uh, feature space and I actually want to visualize these clusters. Right? So what I want to do is I want to map this high dimensional embedding, this 4096 embedding, to a 2D map that actually preserves the pairwise distance of the points. Right? So if my Im the image of the elephant is really far away from the image of the flower in feature space, I still want that when I actually project this 4096 dimension into my 2D map so that I can actually plot it and observe it, this elephant and this flower I st are still far away. And actually this mapping is what we're doing with TSNE. Um, so this was actually um, proposed some time ago. And um, if we actually visualize uh, the MNIST dataset, which is one of the easiest data set to visualize, so this is the, the data set of numbers. You have 10 numbers from 0 to 9. And uh, when you actually train a neural network to detect these numbers and then perform TSNE visualization on top, you can actually see all these clusters appearing. So you can see all these clusters um, in the different colors that we have here. And these are actually the different classes, so from 0 to 9, and you can see they are relatively well separated. So what we did was we projected this high-dimensional feature space into this 2D map. And we can now see a clear clustering for the different classes. Of course, things get more interesting if we actually visualize ImageNet, right? So, so the visualization gets a bit more complex, but we can see roughly that you know, there, there are some images here with um, sky that are clustered together. Images of animals, especially dogs, are clustered together at the bottom right. There are some keyboards here on the top left. There's some food on the bottom left, etc., etc. So visualization, TSNE really helps to see all the clusters that are formed when I actually train the neural network for a specific task. And you can do other stuff. You can apply it on, on ShapeNet, which is this neural network that detects different um, shapes in 3D. So you can see um, the chairs, for example, here, the tables here. These are all nicely clustered in this, uh, in this feature space. So um, TSNE is actually worth using um, if you want to debug your neural network, right? So you have trained your neural network. And now the question is, um, is this neural network going to classify, um, going to do its job correctly, right? So one thing that you can do is you can actually observe uh, what this, this uh, feature space and see whether the clusters actually make sense. And this is especially good for actually visualizing the clusters created by a Siamese network. So there's tons of more visualizations. I recommend this, um, this couple of papers that you can read. Um, to get deeper into different types of visualizations. And these are always helpful to understand what is happening during training of your neural network. So is the network training properly? Is it learning the concepts properly or not? Okay, so this was all for the lecture on visualization and interpretability. Hopefully, um, this will give you some tips on how to use these visualization techniques to actually debug your neural network and understand what your neural network is doing and how is it approaching the task that you're asking it to do. Thank you and see you at the next lecture.